Discuss some of the components of the electrocardiogram. The P wave in general represents atrial depolarization. Generally, the right atrium depolarizes first and then the left atrium, although generally they just make one long P wave. The PR interval is the representative of the conduction delay through the AV node as the signal travels from the atrium to the ventricles. Remember, the PR interval is very important to allow for ventricular filling time. A normal PR interval should be between 120 and 200 milliseconds. The QRS complex represents ventricular depolarization. Normally, the QRS complex is less than 120 milliseconds. Following the QRS complex is the QT interval. During the QT interval is actually when the ventricular muscle contracts. And then finally, the T wave represents ventricular repolarization. Atrial repolarization generally is not seen on a surface 12 lead EKG. The atrium actually has its own T wave, which is called the TA wave, but usually it's masked by the QRS complex because the QRS is much higher voltage. Sometimes you can see a TA wave when there is no QRS complex, such as in severe heart block. The ST segment is normally isoelectric, meaning it's flat. And the ST segment occurs when the ventricles are fully depolarized. As you're aware, ST segment elevation or depression may indicate myocardial ischemia or infarct. A U wave is seen after the T wave, and usually it's very small, and it's seen commonly in patients that have hypokalemia. It's more evident in patients that have bradycardia. In this slide, you can see a diagram of the heart and the conduction system, starting with the sinoatrial node, which is located in the right atrium. Following that, you have the internodal pathways and the atrioventricular node, then the bundle of His, then the common bundle, and the right and left bundle branches. Remember that the left bundle branch has an anterior and posterior fascicle. Following the bundle branches are the Purkinje fibers, and remember that the Purkinje fibers synapse onto ventricular muscle cells. In the middle diagram, you can see that the sinoatrial node depolarization occurs at about the same time as the P wave. So the waves at the top of the diagram represents individual cell action potentials, whereas at the bottom, the ECG represents a surface 12 lead EKG from the skin of the patient. So in actuality, the action potentials that you see in the top of that diagram are much smaller, and these are heavily magnified so that we can see them. Remember that the P wave represents atrial depolarization, and that's why the P wave occurs immediately after the sinoatrial nodal action potential. Following the SA node, you have atrial muscle depolarization, and atrial muscle has a, an action potential that resembles ventricular muscle, except it's a shorter plateau phase. The AV node then activates as well. Remember that the AV node is not made of muscle, therefore you cannot see it on the surface electrocardiogram. It depolarizes and then activates the bundle branches and the Purkinje fibers. But you don't see anything on the electrocardiogram until the QRS complex. The QRS complex is a representative of ventricular muscle depolarization. The Purkinje fibers, the bundle branches, the AV node do not show up on the surface 12 lead EKG, only muscular depolarization, because muscular depolarization is much more massive and easier to see from the skin, from where the electrodes are on the 12 lead EKG. You can see that the T wave on the electrocardiogram correlates with phase three repolarization of the ventricular muscle cells. This slide shows an arrhythmia that you should be very familiar with. This is torsade de pointe, which is French for twisting around a point. Torsade is a polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, meaning each wave looks different than the one previous and following it. This is a VTAC that is characterized by a sinusoidal waveform on ECG. Torsade is dangerous because it is a very fast rhythm. It does not allow time for the ventricle to fill between each beat and therefore can cause hypotension. Torsade can then progress to ventricular fibrillation when the heart becomes severely ischemic.
It's very important to remember that any drug or condition that prolongs the QT interval, such as typical antipsychotics and certain antibiotics, can predispose a patient to torsade de point. This slide shows a delta wave, which is the hallmark of the Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. WPW syndrome is caused by an accessory pathway from the atrium to the ventricle. Normally, the AV node is the only way electrical signals go from the atrium to the ventricle. The rest of the cardiac skeleton acts as an insulator between the atrium and the ventricle so that the signal can only travel through the AV node. However, some people are born with an accessory muscular pathway from the atrium to the ventricle. And in these patients, they can develop a fast connection between the atrium and the ventricle. And that fast connection is represented as the delta wave. Remember that the PR interval generally represents the time it takes for the AV node to depolarize. Patients with WPW are able to bypass the AV node and the delta wave is an indicator of that accessory pathway. The danger from Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome is that these patients often develop what's known as an AVRT, or atrioventricular reentrant tachycardia. And these reentrant tachycardias can be very fast. These reentrant tachycardias are also very dangerous in atrial fibrillation. And therefore, we try to detect these patients early and treat them. Next, we'll discuss some commonly tested EKG tracings that are seen on step one. The first one that you should be familiar with is atrial fibrillation. As you can see from this EKG strip, you have QRS complexes that are spaced across the page, and these QRS complexes, or spikes, are irregularly irregular, meaning that there are different RR intervals each time. And there's no pattern to these RR intervals. You can have a short one, then a long one, and then two shorts. Basically, what this is, is an atrium that is fibrillating and is not contracting in a coordinated manner. And because the atrium is fibrillating, it's sending many signals to the ventricle through the AV node, but only a few of them actually get through and depolarize the ventricle. So what you see at baseline is a fibrillating atrium that causes a wavy but irregular baseline pattern. And then you see QRS complexes that are also irregular. Each QRS complex denotes a contraction of the left and right ventricle. Because the atrium is not contracting properly, blood clots can form in the left and the right atrium. Therefore, most patients that are left in atrial fibrillation are placed on blood thinners and anticoagulants such as Coumadin. And in general, you want to control the rate of the ventricular contractions. If you leave a patient in atrial fibrillation, you usually have to put them on medications such as beta blockers or non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers such as diltiazem or verapamil to control the ventricular rate. You want the rate of the ventricular depolarizations to occur between 60 to 80 beats per minute at rest. If the ventricular rate goes too high during atrial fibrillation, the patient's blood pressure can drop. Atrial flutter is actually similar to atrial fibrillation. However, during flutter, there is a reentrant loop of myocardium in the atrium that depolarizes in a cyclical manner. And this cyclical depolarization leads to a regular sawtooth type pattern at baseline and QRS complexes that occur at regular intervals. So flutter is different than atrial fibrillation because it generally does not cause an irregularly irregular pattern of QRS complexes. Generally, you will have a ratio of two or three flutter waves for every QRS complex. In this diagram, you see that there are four flutter waves for every QRS complex. The way to remember and diagnose atrial flutter is to look at the baseline and look for the sawtooth patterning. In these patients, you try to get them out of atrial flutter back into sinus rhythm 
and this can be occurred by electrical cardioversion or by the use of class 1A, 1C, or 3 antiarrhythmics. Next, we will discuss atrial ventricular block. These are conditions which are commonly tested on USMLE Step 1, so it's very important that you recognize them when they occur. First degree AV block is simply caused by some type of benign process that prevents the signal from the atrium from traveling to the ventricle within the normal amount of time. The way to diagnose first degree AV block is to look for the difference in time between the P wave and the QRS. You start from the beginning of the P wave and you go towards the beginning of the QRS complex. If the beginning of the P wave and the beginning of the QRS complex are greater than 200 milliseconds apart or one large block on the EKG, that denotes first degree AV block. First degree AV block in and of itself is benign and asymptomatic and does not need to be treated. Second degree AV block, however, begins to become a little bit more worrisome. Second degree AV block type 1, also known as Wenckebach phenomenon, is denoted by a progressive lengthening of the PR interval, so that you can see the PR interval lengthening with each heartbeat. So if you look on the left of this EKG strip, you can see a P wave and then a QRS and then a T wave. And then on the next heartbeat, you can see that the PR interval has widened greatly. With each heartbeat, the PR interval widens until you see a P wave followed by a pause. And this indicates that the QRS has dropped. Wenckebach is commonly seen in patients that have elevated vagal activity. And most young people while they're sleeping will have Wenckebach phenomena. Wenckebach in and of itself is asymptomatic and does not need to be treated. What Wenckebach generally re represents is an atrioventricular node with a great deal of vagal or, par or parasympathetic input. Mobitz type 2 AV nodal block is different. In Mobitz type 2, what you will see is a PR interval that does not lengthen from beat to beat, and then all of a sudden you will see a P wave, which is seen in the middle of this QRS strip, with no QRS complex after it. And what you can see is that the 6th P wave and the 8th P wave, as well as the 10th P wave here, do not have QRS complexes after them. Mobitz type 2 generally is caused by either calcification of the his Purkinje system or possibly a myocardial infarction that has damaged part of the conduction system. Mobitz type 2 generally is considered a more serious condition and these patients often progress to third degree AV block. These patients generally will require a pacemaker. Third degree AV block occurs when the P waves and the QRSs have no relationship to each other whatsoever. The P waves move at their own interval, and the QRS complexes move at their own interval as well. The P waves are not conducted across the AV node into the ventricle. The atrial rate, or the P wave rate, generally is faster than that of the QRS complexes. The QRS complexes are generated by either the AV node or by some other cell in the his Purkinje system or in the ventricular myocytes generating what is called an escape rhythm. This escape rhythm keeps the patient alive, though this patient generally will have a slower QRS rate than if it were conducted. This is because the intrinsic automaticity of the AV node and the cells below it is generally slower than that of the sinoatrial node. These patients are generally given pacemakers. Some classic causes of third degree AV block include Lyme disease in young people, which can damage the conducting system of the, of the heart, as well as Chagas disease, as well as simple myocardial inf infarctions, which damage the conduction system of the heart as well. Elderly patients with type 2 heart block will often progress to third degree heart block and present with syncope because of bradycardia.
A more serious heart rhythm is ventricular fibrillation. Ventricular fibrillation generally occurs after myocardial infarctions. V-fib is a completely erratic rhythm with no identifiable ventricular QRS complexes. These patients require CPR, including chest compressions, and immediate electrical defibrillations.